Welcome to our program. This is the first in a new series of programs recently taped in Israel that we've chosen to title Treasures of the Jewish World. It's unfortunate, but most Christians today have little or no knowledge of the historical and cultural foundations of their faith. Much of what we experience and much of what we do is a product of the Hellenistic world dating from the 4th and 5th centuries of the present era. There is little understanding that the historical foundations of the Christian faith are rooted firmly in the Judaism of the 1st century, in the land of Israel, and in cities such as Nazareth, Capernaum, and other cities around the Sea of Galilee, and, of course, the city of Jerusalem. Although most Christians are at least passively aware that Jesus of Nazareth was a Jew, yet there are those who believe that he was the first Christian and the founder of the Christian church. However, Jesus was not only a Jew, but a rabbi, and utilized well-known rabbinic methods in his teaching and operated entirely within the structure of the historic Judaism of his day. Further, this new movement that grew out of the teachings of Jesus and his disciples was a movement that operated strictly within the confines of the Judaism of Jesus' day. When we think of treasure, we usually think of some tangible object of intrinsic worth. But in our new series, Treasures of the Jewish World, I would like to invite you to come and go back with me in time and look at treasures of immeasurable worth, ideas, concepts, and people that all together serve as the historical backdrop for our faith. I can think of no better place to begin than the city of Jerusalem and one of the most sacred and historically significant sites in all the Jewish world, the Temple Mount, the Temple of God in Jerusalem. In Jesus' day, it had been refurbished by Herod the Great and surpassed in architectural splendor and majesty any structure throughout all of ancient Israel. In the Talmud, in Tractate Sukkah 51 and 2, it states, No one has seen a truly beautiful building unless he has seen the temple. Herod's project of refurbishing the temple to win the favor of the Jews was a monumental enterprise that required vast quantities of building materials, including huge, hand-chiseled, smooth, rectangular stones, each containing a border called a marginal draft, so distinctive in style, size, and workmanship that the stones are called Herodian stones. According to Josephus, 10,000 stonemasons and stone cutters labored, and over a thousand wagons were manufactured to help bring the stones from the quarry. The re-innovation of the temple probably began in the 18th year of King Herod, around 20 B.C., and although the temple proper was probably completed in his lifetime, the plan as a whole was probably never completely finished. The Gospel of John in chapter 2 and verse 20 tells us that it took 46 years to build this magnificent temple of God. The archaeological excavations at the Temple Mount were unique in many ways. First, it was one of the few archaeological excavations to work year-round. And secondly, it was one of the few to enjoy such a large number of volunteers that came from all over the world to give both their time and effort in the accomplishment of a monumental archaeological task. And finally, the discoveries themselves are some of the most exciting and historically significant of any archaeological excavations in Israel to date. The archaeological excavations at the Temple Mount began in February of 1968, just shortly after the Jews were provided access to the area after the Six-Day War that took place in June of 1967, and I 
personally joined the excavations in June of 1968, and we immediately excavated down and found the base of the archway at the staircase that led into the Taropian Valley. Let me show it to you here on this uh, reconstruction of the uh, temple compound that was drawn as a result of our archaeological excavations. And here you see the area where we began and the staircase that led into the Tyropean Valley providing access into the temple itself. We found the limestone street that ran along the southern wall of the temple compound and at the southwest corner of the uh, street and of the uh, temple itself, we found here on the street evidences of the destruction of the temple that took place on the ninth day of the Jewish month of Av in 70 of the present era. And one of the stones had an inscription on it in Hebrew that said to the place of trumpeting, Levet hat ki ah, the stone that marked the very place here way up on top of the, the temple itself where the priest would stand to blow the shofar to announce the beginning of the Sabbath and other feasts and festivals. We know of this from the writings of Josephus in Wars of the Jews, book 4, chapter 9, and paragraph 12. And I'd like to read to you just a little brief sentence. It says, And the last was erected above the top of the postephoria, where one of the priests stood, of course, and gave a signal beforehand with a trumpet at the beginning of every seventh day, in the evening twilight, as also at the evening when the day was finished, as giving notice to the people when they were to leave off work and when they were to go to work again. And this is the only record of which we know describing the blowing of the shofar to mark the beginning and the end of the Sabbath. As our excavations progressed, we moved out into this area known as the Ophel, and we found this monumental staircase leading up to double gates in the southern wall that provided access into the temple itself. And here in this monumental staircase, we found a ritual immersion bath complex. And perhaps this whole area is to be associated with the events recorded in the second chapter of the book of Acts relative to the preaching of the gospel by the apostle Peter and the falling of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. This whole area is well known to us in Jewish sources as the assembling area for the Jews during the three great pilgrim festivals, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now this whole area, fortunately for us, has been opened up today as an archaeological garden. Now when we go to our field report, you're going to see the support wall behind me dating from the Herodian, Crusader, and Turkish periods, three different historical periods. And that will be located here on our map. Now you notice the lower courses of stones are the Herodian stones with their marginal draft. And the height of most of these stones, these smooth cut ashlers as they're called, is about 3.3 feet. They're remarkable for their length and some of them measure over 36 feet long and weigh from 50 to 100 tons or more. Needless to say, the temple of God was not only a great treasure of the Jewish world, but an engineering marvel. This wall where we're going to be going is not a part of the temple itself, but it is one of the most sacred sites in Judaism. Only since June of 1967, has it been readily accessible to not just Jews, but all who would visit this sacred site. In the background, you'll see Jews from the various periods of Judaism, 
orthodox, conservative, reform, as well as perhaps people from other faiths. But principally, notice the orthodox, those in black who come daily to stand or sit before the wall and to recite their prayers. Behind me is perhaps what is considered to be one of the greatest treasures of the Jewish world. With me today is Rabbi Dr. Daniel Trapper, the former advisor to the Minister of Education here in Israel. Rabbi, it's good to have you with me uh, on the program today. And can you tell us what is this wall that's behind us here? Well, I'm delighted to be here, Roy. Uh, this wall is one of the holiest sites in the Jewish world. It has two names. It's called either the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall, because it's a place where so many Jews have come to wail, to cry, to shed tears, and kind of talk directly to God. Uh, a kind of feeling that it's just about the closest place physically I can get to God. And it's called the Western Wall because this is the support wall, the Western support wall of what was the outer court of the Holy Temple when it stood in Jerusalem before it was destroyed about 1900 years ago by Titus. Uh, the wall that we see here actually is only a small portion of the Western Wall itself. Um, you got about 50% of it above ground. Uh, originally, the area that we're standing on was much deeper. This was a much taller wall, and the whole exposed area here is maybe 10% of its real length. It goes down about another 500 meters, which the archaeologists have been digging now. Uh, the wall is special also in its construction. I mean, the, the stones you see out here are relatively small compared to some of the others. There are some stones in there that are about 16 meters long and over 50 tons in weight. It's just a massive structure. Now, we believe that this wall remained more than any of the other walls of the temple because we're told that the other walls were built by the rich people. It was the poor people that built this wall. And God said, because they built this wall, this wall is going to last forever. And so now for 1900 years, we haven't had a temple and we've only had this wall, which is the only remnant of that great temple. And it's a symbolic remembrance of the glory which we once had on this place. And so the Jews, for 1900 years, have come to this spot, just about uninterrupted, and prayed to God for all their needs. Now, this wall actually wasn't a part of the original temple, was it? No, this wall was a wall of the outer court which surrounded the temple itself. We have no remnants of the temple building itself. That's further in. The Dome of the Rock, which is that beautiful uh, structure with the gold top, uh, that's the spot where the temple was once constructed, but there's nothing remaining. Uh, what would you say is the importance of the wall for the Jewish people today? Well, the wall is important because it's what we have, what remains. I would assume that for someone living 2,000 years ago when the temple was up, the wall was rather secondary. I mean, this was only the wall of the outer courtyard. Uh, for, for that person, the main, the main thing that he had was the temple itself. But for us, this is all we have, and therefore it's of such great significance, especially because of the special love that God has for it since it was built by the poor people. Now tell me, who are these people that are over here behind us, especially those in the black and with the, the prayer shawls? Who, who are these people? Well, these people themselves are uh, Orthodox Jews, uh, Jews that are generally associated with the Hasidic group. This is a, a, a sect within orthodoxy. Uh, they're wearing prayer shawls, many of them. You see wearing these white, it's called talitot in Hebrew. They're prayer shawls that one uses when he prays. Now the ones that are religious that come here to pray, basically what is it for, what, for which they're praying? Well, they pray for many things. Um, 
Jewish prayer is generally silent prayer, and therefore we never know exactly what someone is saying. But there are really two kinds of prayers. The first is a personal prayer. Each one of us has our own needs, health, family, economic problems, business problems. Everyone prays for what he himself needs. And then there is communal prayer, the kind of prayer that we, we pray for something in common. There are certain needs of the Jewish people, Jewish people all over the world. We're unfortunately a people that have not been short of problems. And even today we have communal needs and we may pray for things we need right now. And we may have dreams that perhaps one day the temple will one day be rebuilt again and our former glory will be restored. The religious history of the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, begins with Abraham, who built an altar on this mountain to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice unto God. Centuries later, God appeared to David the king on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. It was here that David's son Solomon constructed the first temple, perhaps the most costly and beautiful edifice that the world has ever known. This temple was destroyed in 586 BC on the ninth day of the Jewish month of Av by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. It was rebuilt and rededicated in 516 by Zerubbabel and the returnees from Babylonian exile. Around 28 BC, Herod the Great, in order to win favor with the Jews, began an auspicious program of enlarging and refurbishing the temple of Zerubbabel. Herod expanded the temple compound with support walls to the south and to the west, greatly increasing the size of the temple compound. Along the southern end of the compound, he constructed a magnificent colonnaded stoa, or open-air porch. A staircase along the southern wall provided access into the temple area through double gates known as the Hula gates after the prophetess Hula from the time of Josiah in 621 BC. From the gates, a staircase led through the wall and then up into the temple compound proper. At one time, it was thought that the location of the temple was where the Dome of the Rock stands today but it has recently been suggested that it was actually oriented to the north where the Dome of the Spirits or the Dome of the Tablets is situated. Not many years ago, a young man studying at the American Institute of Holy Land Studies here in Jerusalem fell in a tomb at the Eastern Gate and discovered the archways of the ancient gate into the city. From Jewish sources, this gate apparently was immediately in front of the gate leading into the temple compound. So evidently the temple was situated to the north of the Dome of the Rock. If this is correct, the temple could conceivably be rebuilt without disturbing the Dome of the Rock. Is there any real move to rebuild the temple being made? We hear a lot in Christian circles today, especially evangelical circles, about the rebuilding of the temple. And yes, there are those Jews here in the country today who are interested in the rebuilding of the temple. But by and large, no united effort or specific plans to rebuild the temple are being made. No stones have been cut. None are being cut for the rebuilding of the temple. And those who know Jewish history shouldn't really be surprised. For although the temple was a magnificent structure, and not just a great treasure, but in fact one of the real wonders of the world, the scriptures indicate that God's plan or purpose was not to dwell in a physical structure made with hands, but to dwell in his people. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, we read, Asuli Makdash, 
ושכנתי בתוך עם. Make for me a physical structure, but I'm going to have my dwelling place in them, or in my people. Some might ask about passages in the Bible, such as in the books of Daniel and Revelation, concerning the abomination of desolation standing in the temple. But keeping in mind God's purpose or plan for his people to dwell in them. Is it not an interesting question that we pose? Could not the abomination of desolation be, in fact, referring to a falling away on the part of God's people from true biblical faith? Well, only time will tell. All around us, we see the rubble and the ruins of the magnificent temple of God here in Jerusalem, destroyed on the ninth day of the Jewish month of Av in 70 A.D. by Titus and the Roman army. And with the destruction of the temple, an era in Jewish history came to an end. But out of the ashes, out of the ruin, and out of the rubble, a new era began. Although in A.D. 70, the destruction of this magnificent edifice caused mourning and consternation, the Jews were quick to recover. And the decisions that were made on the part of the spiritual leaders of Judaism had far-reaching implications for the people of God even until today. Non-Jews, unfamiliar with the principal tenets of Judaism and Jewish history, are unaware of the important changes that took place within the structure of historical Judaism after the destruction of the temple, or the implications that these have for all the people of God until today. Christians, generally speaking, know that with the destruction of the temple, the sacrifices and the oblation ceased. But what is not generally known by Christians are the significant changes that took place in the structure of historic Judaism that have profound implications for all people of God. The historical events are interesting as well as significant. Now, several traditional stories are told, but there is one that is especially interesting. Before the destruction of the temple in 68 of the present era, a very famous rabbi, Yehochanan ben Zakkai, knew that the cause was lost and that the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple was imminent. He had his disciples carry him out of the city in a coffin as dead. And from there, he was carried directly into the camp of the Roman general Vespasian, the father of Titus, who later destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Once inside the camp, Yehochanan ben Zakkai got out of the coffin and requested an audience with Vespasian. In this meeting, he prophesied from Isaiah chapter 10, Lebanon will fall by a mighty one. Lebanon, he said, was allegorically used for Jerusalem. And in this, he foretold Vespasian's victory. Vespasian was so moved that he granted Ben Zakkai's request to move with his students from Jerusalem to Yavne, south of modern-day Tel Aviv, and there opened an academy for the preservation of Judaism. His request was granted, 
and Ben Zakkai and his disciples moved to Yavne, opened an academy, and after the destruction of the temple, the great Sanhedrin was also transferred to Yavne. The destruction of the temple was a tremendous loss and caused much mourning. But Ben Zakkai and his students knew that Judaism must and could continue to exist, perhaps with even greater meaning and fervor than before. They immediately declared that three things, the reading of Torah, the offering up of prayers, and the doing of acts of tzedakah, righteousness, almsgiving, or charity, took the place and perhaps even superseded the offering up of sacrifices in the temple. This has remained for over 1900 years now as one of the basic principles or tenets of Judaism. And perhaps there is an important lesson to be learned by all those who love God that this, the study of God's word, the offering up of prayers, and the doing of acts of tzedakah, righteousness or kindness to one's fellow man is perhaps the greatest way in which one can serve God. I hope that that can be a lesson for us all.